I don't know. It's uh, I know we have another presenter coming. No, it's okay. But would anybody jump in if there are any questions or thoughts? That have any questions? Sherry. Sure. I want to thank you guys for focusing in on Thoreau's interest in lichens. Of of all of his natural <coughs> interests, for me, his interest in lichens and ice are the two mm. top ones. Yeah. Um, and you know, pulling really bringing us into a deeper focus of what he saw about lichens. Even that quote you read about um, the value of mutual intelligence. That was Laura. Or right, that you mentioned, Laura. Right, that. Um, did they know, do we know if they knew at that time that, that it was a symbiotic plant relationship? It was also? just becoming understood. Tucker, so they talk about Tucker, the, the lichenologist. Yes, right, right, right. Just so becoming. So it was right around that right time. Around that time so he's, he's, you know, that statement taps into a lot of levels of understanding about what's what's going on. But thank you for pulling. I mean, one of the values of coming here is there are so many people within this community who have. E extracted and distilled out his thoughts in many areas, which if any one of us sat down with the tome of writing, would take more than several lifetimes to do. So thank you for going into this area and pulling out. You know, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the hike in yeah, the Great Meadows. <laughs> There's been so many synchronicities that have happened uh, while we're here. This, this place must vibrate at a slightly higher level than the rest of the world. I've just, uh, just been struck by the conversations and the experiences that we've had here. It'll take us some time to digest them all. For sure. So, did you have a question? Um, she does have a question. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Oh, she, okay. <laughs> Somebody? No? Did I miss one? Um, Anyways, I, it, did everybody get a postcard? If not, please come up here and get one afterwards. And uh, we've left a place in the book at the back for field notes so that people can find them on their own. That would be a great idea. I'm just going to read another. Okay. We have another great presentation coming shortly. It's but right. it's right. another time. I'll read a, a more, a little bit more personal one. Uh, how I got exposed. Here's my <laughs> confession. How I got exposed to Walden. I haven't been here, by the way, in 43 years. Uh, Going back to Walden, walking first clockwise, counterclockwise, and then on the, the hike for uh, the meditational hike the other way the next day. So uh, both times pausing at the hut. I had been there, and some, this is the story of the book, which I won't read to you, but that was a life changer for me. Uh, when Connie asked everyone to say their watershed and, and say something, uh, I heard myself say the words, that was a, a life changer for me. I knew it was, but then you, sometimes you hear yourself say something when you're asked to say something. And uh, I guess it was a kind of a watershed moment. But it goes back a little further than that with my father, and um, from that chapter on him, I threw some literary memoirs in here to complete the, the scope of the book. I cannot say when it was that my father picked up his copy of Walden and Civil Disobedience. I only remember clearly that day when he showed it to me saying, someday you're I was about 10, maybe 12. I can remember his hands, the cherry bookshelf where it stood, along with its companion authors, Upton Sinclair, Edgar Rice, Burroughs, Bertrand Russell. The bookcase is here with me today, just as I write. It survived several of our moves as a family from Wisconsin to Texas, back to Wisconsin, out to California, and lastly up to Ontario. The crayon scrawls on the back remind me of the moving vans that one transported it, number 23, number 7. The cherry grain running throughout has not diminished through the years. If anything, that deepening patina has removed it. My father, Robert Eugene, is no longer here to read them, at least the, not that I can readily perceive. Yet, like other persons mentioned in the covers of this book, he's not quite out of reach. At four o'clock in the morning, when I tend to write this, or rather, most of it, he is just that much closer. And. Uh, it's funny how, you know, you go down a path and you're heading there, thinking again about that first meditational walk that morning. Your mind is filled with thoughts, and as you walk in silence, slowly those thoughts seep out. And uh, what does Thoreau say? I don't call it God, I call it nature. And, and as, as Mr. Richardson yes, yesterday said, there's that friendliness of it. And, and it kind of comes in there and it gives you the support that you need to go the places you need to go in your mind, those, those delicate spots that uh, make all the difference. 
Uh, again, I'd like to thank the Thoreau Society so much for giving us this opportunity. And uh, it's a beautiful scene you have here in Concord, and I hope to be able to come again someday. But feel free if anybody, you know, like we have a few minutes, I think. Sure. Yes. A few minutes. If anybody has any thoughts on the whole weekend or how, uh, what was the, the moment of them of, of most uh, synchronicity or someone they met who said something that maybe took them in a direction they think they might be going. And I talked to you know, Carmela yesterday about healing and uh, certainly music and, and poetry and the journals. All those things can be healing tools and I think we all seriously need them. So if anybody has any thoughts about that or any other matter, or, or botanical matters, please uh, bring them forward. And then we're going to segue into uh, our next presenter. And I, I don't know your name. Uh, my name? Yes. Nikita. Nikita. Nikita's coming up next. <laughs> All right, let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much.